A game one of the NBA Finals reaction edition of the Just Basketball Show coming your way next. Wes, first, a question to kick us off. I was listening to local radio here in Phoenix like an hour or two before tip-off of game one on Thursday afternoon. And one of the hosts made the case that this game, this series, was the one he was most hyped for. And he said a decade. So I'm assuming maybe those early Cavs Warriors uh, years must have been what he was talking about. He didn't specify. How hyped were you compared to recent years for Mavs Celtics? And although game one obviously was a blowout, are you still feeling like we're going to get an exciting, fun series? What is your your 30,000-foot view of what we're headed for in this finals? It's a little bit hard to tell. So Michael Jackson used to always do this thing where he would say, like, silence creates tension, and then when you break the silence, there's a release, right? And so, like, at these Michael Jackson concerts, he would just go full, like, a full minute without doing anything, just standing on stage, waiting for the anticipation to build up, and then providing that release for the fans. And that's sort of what we got because the conference finals went by so quickly and there was such a long break between the conference finals and the start of the NBA finals that it just felt like the anticipation was building the entire time. About three days before the finals even started, we were already done, fully saturated with storylines and X's and O's previews and stuff. I stopped listening to podcasts. I stopped reading anything about the finals because I had already read We had everything. our reaction to all the different outcomes that could happen already in our back pocket right. by Monday. Right. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. It's hard to decipher whether or not I was actually excited for this series, just in a vacuum, or if I was just excited because it was basketball after such a long time. That said, yeah. um, it whatever it was, it didn't live up to the hype. That first game was extremely disappointing, not just because the Celtics blew him out, but because the game was over so quickly. It wasn't even like we got an awesome first half, and then they blew him out in the second half. This felt like the Boston Celtics. They walked in NBA, NBA Finals Game 1 like they had been there before, totally cool, calm, and collected. And the Mavericks walked in and acted like they had never been there before because they haven't. And the Celtics just took it to them, and we kind of knew how this one was going to play out. Basically, after the first quarter, after the Celtics went up 17 points. And, uh, yeah, it's got to be a little disappointing because of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't disagree. I think, you know, you look at, like, 2018 Game 1, which is the J.R. Smith uh, flub at the end or the Tony Parker shot with the AC going out and the cramps and everything in 2013. Like, we've seen some classic game ones. This isn't even going to be close to that. But uh, I'll say I am still feeling good about the possibility that we get a fun series here. I think we'll get into it in our reaction. But this just happens. You have this big of a gap in three-point shooting especially it is 2024 that's how a lot of these games are decided so I'm not feeling like it's going to be 18 point games in every direction all series long but yeah you would have liked to see a little bit more we'll break down uh what we'll, we'll give our five over reactions maybe we'll go more than five to game one both sides Mavs Celtics and where this thing is headed plus a look ahead to the Lakers offseason after they clearly are zeroing in on Dan Hurley as I use insider language there to be their next head coach. All of that coming up on today's episode of the Just Basketball Show. Oh, a Welcome into the Just Basketball Show. It is Friday, June 7th. I'm Brendan Clean. That over there is Wes Goldberg. Third episode of the week coming to you after game one of the NBA Finals. We have coaching news and more in Tinseltown. Is that what they call it, Wes? Los Angeles, California, where the Lakers play basketball. We'll get into that side of things to close us out. Follow, rate, and review wherever you're finding us. Hit subscribe on the Just Basketball Fans YouTube channel if you like what you're hearing and watching. We also have content every day on our Tic Tac, Instagram, and X accounts, so go follow us over there. Just search Just Basketball. Get that content throughout the finals, throughout the offseason, and beyond. Support for today's episode of the Just Basketball comes from BetMGM. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, 
Do it now. Use the bonus code Just Basketball. Get up to fifteen hundred dollars in a first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's how it works: Download the BetMGM sportsbook app on iOS or Android and sign up using the code Just Basketball. Step two: Deposit at least ten dollars and place your first wager on any game. Step three. Receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if that bet loses. Just make sure to use the bonus code Just Basketball when you sign up. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older to wager. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Wes, final score of game one, 107-89. to 89. We touched on the letdown that it sort of was to, clo- to open up the show, but we're going to go through our overreactions. It's Friday morning. We've cleared our heads. We've had a sleep uh, since the buzzer sounded. We're going to hit on what we saw in game one, what that could mean, and maybe get a little dramatic about it. I'll let you kick us off. What do you got? First overreaction from that game one. The Boston Celtics don't need Jason Tatum to be great to win this series is my first overreaction. Uh, If Jalen Brown is going to play like that, If they're going to get 20 points and three blocks in 20 minutes from Kristaps Porzingis in his return, he looked great. And if their defense overall is going to limit Dallas the way that it was able to limit Dallas, and Kyrie Irving cannot uh, get free, and Luka Doncic is is forced to score tough bucket after tough bucket, then maybe the Celtics don't need an elite Jason Tatum to even win this series. That's my first overreaction. Now, key word there overreaction that's what we're doing here uh i do think that ultimately the celtics are going to need big games big moments from jason tatum i think that the series is going to be a lot closer than it was in game one going forward but my point being is that they already won one game without an elite jason tatum they only need to win three more exactly so it's not as if we're not playing the long view here right these are just little finite uh instances here and there and um, if they can, if the if they can win a couple more games with that three point variance being what it was, they outscored the Mavericks by 27 points from beyond the arc in this game. There's just it feels like there's more ways for Dallas to or, or for Boston to beat Dallas than there are for Dallas to beat Boston. And in some of those ways, Jason Tatum will have to be great. But in other versions of of these ways, Jason Tatum does not necessarily have to be great. How obnoxious would it be of me to like point out how impactful he was on defense as a rebuttal to that? Is that just like, am I just it, drinking the Boston Kool Aid? That's exactly it, what you're doing. Yeah, tell me more okay. about how he's a great screen setter and and gets everybody yeah, yeah, else yeah. involved on offense. I don't Zoning think. up on the backside of the right. of the defense while they send help and all that stuff. Okay, yeah, we won't do that. I, I, I'll just throw another. I'll just throw another overreaction your way, which is right on par with this one, which is that Jalen Brown will win finals MVP. Now, to me, not an overreaction. That was my pick, but uh, this dude was incredible. And honestly, a lot of the notes that I had watching this game and watching him and then, you know, looking back through some stuff this morning was about the the non-X's and O's, non-sophisticated basketball stuff, although he did plenty there as well. Like, he just was... From the opening tip, the guy that clearly wanted to set a tone on the offensive end, of course he has the Luka matchup, but it felt like the the readiness and the the normalness, which isn't always the case for teams in this spot that you pointed out, Wes, I I attribute a ton of that to Jalen. He had that massive dunk, I believe, in the second quarter that kind of kept, you know, the crowd in it, the energy, like those are plays that I think if you're Jalen Brown, you're you're making a decision to do that stuff, right? Like that that's premeditated to a degree. And then in the third quarter, he answered the only time this game ever got close, that timeout, Luca's smiling, it's eight point game, four and a half or so minutes, I believe, left. And it was like, wow, we're getting a we're getting a game that wouldn't have disappointed us as we hit in that first segment or that that open. And what happens? Jalen Brown, drive and kick, drive and kick, drive and kick, score, throw it to the corner, whatever. Just responded. He had a, a couple different times where he just stripped Luka completely. It was from start to finish, and he made. they helped make sure that finish was like early in the fourth. It didn't even take 48 minutes. It was Jalen setting that tone and being the guy that 
took this game over and, and really made sure that it wasn't another creaky, you know, a whole Friday of questioning Boston. And I think if he keeps that up, they'll have the voters will have no choice, even right. though we like to debate whose team this is and all that stuff. If he does this three more times, they're going to win the series and he'll probably get that award. If we were executing this segment right, we would have just come out right right away and said Jalen Brown is Boston's best player, and it's not even close in terms of an overreaction. That's right? why that, we're not on true... Fox Sports 1, Wes. <laughs> that's that's it's, a true uh, overreaction. We're not there yet. We haven't graduated to the big leagues. But to your point, you could point out all the Jason Tatum stuff, the backline defense, yeah. zoning up, all these things. Well, guess what? Jalen Brown did all those things and then also scored efficiently on offense. And that's why he was the best two-way player in this series. It's why he was the best – or in that game one. It's why he was the best player on the court in game one. You mentioned all the defense that he was providing too. that backline help. He had two blocks on one play, deflecting stuff at the rim. Boston basically turned off the faucet on most of what Boston want, on most of what Dallas wants to do offensively. But even when the Mavericks got those rare shots that were open at the rim, Jalen Brown flew in and blocked mm -hmm. them, just swatted them out of the way. One on Derek Jones Jr. in the third quarter. Um, and so he's making these huge swing plays, the full court pressure on Luca picking up picking him up half court and stripping him twice in this game kind of throwing him out of rhythm these were impactful point creating out of nothing swing plays in a in a in a finals game they were immensely important offensively i to me and i've said this to you before i thought it was a really rough start to the season for jalen brown i think back to that weird game winner that he tried to get against charlotte early in the celtic season and he he kind of just meanders his way into a mid-range jumper and and he kind of bricks it and i think that i think the celtics even lost that game and it was a little bit of a bug in boston's and joe missoula's five out we're gonna do the three-point math problem offense and that yeah. bug has become a feature now where while the celtics are over here doing calculus jalen brown is like screw your math problem i'm not solving for x i'm putting my head down and i'm getting to the basket and he did that a number of times and that has been so important I, I don't think the Celtics offense works now without that element from Jalen Brown because yeah. he's the only one who really does it consistently. Every once in a while, you get it from Tatum. Jalen Brown's doing it all the time. And yeah. I loved what I saw from him getting downhill, attacking pick and rolls, attacking those switches, not worrying about the math problem, just saying, I'm gonna, I can go get a bucket right now. I'm just going to go get it. How's that for your math problem? And I love it. They need it. Yeah, there's a quote that always uh, comes out, I think, when we're talking about player development in basketball, people attribute it to Denzel Washington. I have actually no idea where it came from. The whole idea of do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. And I I love when players, and it sometimes takes time, come back around to what made them special in high school, in college, earlier in their early in their NBA careers after all the debate and the nonsense about what they need to improve on and all these things. And don't get me wrong, Jalen Brown, he's not an elite uh, ball handler. He's not the best of the best as a passer. But to your point, he doesn't have to be because he right. fills a role on this team that looks a hell of a lot like when he was coming out of Cal and he was a raw power forward, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how he plays. He just added the elements of his game that allowed him to raise the floor up so he can be that again. And like, it's kind of obnoxious to always return to how ugly it looked in you know the Miami series last year or the finals the year before that. But look, that's the shadow this team is in. And I feel like his footwork, his reading of the floor, he's just made these incremental improvements on the things that he is good at in order to make up for the things that we know he's bad at and fill a, a really valuable role and here for, for this team that, that they need. They're going to need it. Yeah, and we talk a lot about how the Celtics built this roster basically to compensate for the fact that Jason Tatum isn't sort of that top four or five guy in the NBA. It also compensates a lot for what Jalen Brown can't do. You mentioned the ball handling. He's a little bit better. He's not awesome. He doesn't have to do what Kyrie Irving does, though, in tight quarters with, yeah. with a ball on a string because he's playing in so much space all the time. Yeah. He doesn't have to be a great ball handler. He's usually going one-on-one. -on -one. And if he's able to get you to his on his left shoulder, he's just going to drive to the right side and you're finished. And that's it because he yeah. can get strong and he can get downhill. So as much as this team compensates and the roster build compensates for what Jason Tatum isn't, it also compensates for a lot of what Jalen Brown isn't. But that's okay. That's okay. That's sort of the beauty of what, what they built here. Really, it's just, I mean, 
I think for Jalen, it's and, and all this this whole team, a lot of it's just decisiveness, and that's why I think yeah. the way that they started the game was so important because a lot of it is does stem from confidence. And I did the video for our TikTok this week about like if you're going to play this way, you got to play this way. And when the 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 doubt creeps in. Like in the beginning of this game, you know, it was close for the first several minutes and Luca actually started really well, but, and they missed a few threes and like even a great game for them, you're missing three out of five threes and I, the mental gymnastics of dealing with that sucks probably at times. But, you know, again, that, that Jalen factor to just be the guy to kind of put his head down and, and get to the basket and, and be decisive in his own way, doing what they need him to do is huge. Let's, uh, you want to stay on the Celtics or go to the Mavs? I have an, I have an overreaction to throw your way. Yeah, let's let's do some Maverick stuff. Um, okay. Go ahead, go first. Well, I don't know how to phrase this phrase this one. You might be able to help me uh, get our get our FS one on here, but Kyrie just needs to be better. Okay, here's how we do it. I have it down. <laughs> Kyrie Irving is the biggest reason for Dallas's game one loss. There we go. There we go. I was very close, and I couldn't. Uh, make a fool of myself so much to actually put it this way but I was gonna say like maybe Derek Lively is actually gonna be the second best player in this series but then I was not like no that's like not true game one. Kyrie <laughs> Kyrie has to be it right. and that's kind of the point here so right yeah uh I, honestly like the three-point shooting is is huge and that's gonna be a, a swing factor in every game Wes but if Kyrie is 20% better this is a game he was so bad and in yeah. these almost the exact opposite of Jalen Brown where in a lot of key moments Kyrie fell short and missed obvious open shots we've seen him hit a hundred times or threw the ball to nobody Jalen was answering Kyrie was like hanging up the phone and it was it really made no sense I'm not going to go so far as to do the whole Boston crowd and the history and all that it really just felt like he just played a bad basketball game and I don't think that'll continue but if it does they're in for it he sucked he was, <laughs> he was really so bad, bad. what he, what happened <laughs> he had he he went six for 19 overall missed all five of his three-point attempts had two assists and three turnovers for just 12 points the weird thing about Kyrie is he had the most memorable basket of the game. In the first quarter, he goes up to the right side of the floor, pulls up from 13 feet out, makes a shot over Al Horford and Derek White, high arcing moon ball, and drains it. And the broadcast, JJ Redick, Doris Burke, they're like, oh my God, only Kyrie can make these plays. And it's so cool. And if you're just a casual going through your highlight reel after this game, you're like, wow, Kyrie's a, Kyrie's a hooper, man. That guy balled. No, he didn't. He was awful in this game. That was the most memorable shot, but he did that thing way too many times where he would just race up the floor and just put up some ill-advised yeah. early jumper in the shot clock before his teammates can come back for a chance for, to get in rebounding position, before they could do the mismatch hunting. I thought, I, do, I will go so far as to say I think the crowd and the moment got to Kyrie a little bit. It felt to me like he was trying to beat the Celtics by himself sometimes. He was trying to out-Celtics the Celtics. And when, Ma when, when the Mavericks were able to make their third quarter comeback and turn it back into an eight-point game, I think they did it by slowing it down, playing their style of basketball, get the ball in Lucas' hands, do the mismatch hunting, do the problem solving, and get to your spots. Because as great as a player as Kyrie Irving is and as, as an amazing of a shot maker he can be, his spot is not from 13 and 16 feet out with 20 seconds on the shot clock falling away on a contested jumper. He needs to get to the rim. He needs to attack those mismatches and get to the bucket and use that handle and all those things that we love about him. So um, I, I, I thought it was a really just out of character performance by Kyrie who talked the talk about, I've been in this finals perform. I've been in the final stage before. I'm the emotional leader of the team. They're going to follow my lead, man. If they followed Kyrie's lead, then that was the wrong way to go because I didn't think he approached this game at all the right way. And, Going forward, I think they need to take the ball out of Kyrie's hands, play out of Luka more, and if Kyrie is going to exact his revenge on the Boston Celtics, he's going to have to ride Luka to do it. Yeah, okay. So the third quarter is exactly where I focus yeah. too. And it's, again, it, it really is like a, a complete inverse of how Jalen quieted that run down. Kyrie also kind of did his part to quiet it down. I mean, they're, they're rolling. Like you said, they're that, I think that stretch was maybe their most effective picking on, uh, Boston's centers and, and actually getting some 
matchups that they wanted and, and playing their chess game a little bit. And then Kyrie goes two of, I believe, two of nine in the third quarter. Yeah. They you know, it so it's he comes off of screen on the right side of the floor, wide open jumper, just right off the back rim. I mean, he missed he missed a couple of shots in that third quarter that could have really made this game interesting. Yeah, and and so and the other thing quickly too is Luca was assisted on zero percent of his made field goals in this game. Mm. He did not have a basket that another player assisted. Now, okay, it's Luca. Sure, that's not he's not, you know, Kyle Corver or something, but at the same time, that number's usually around twenty percent. This postseason it's been a little lower, still seventeen. And I, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but my guess is a lot of that's Kyrie because that's the only other guy who consistently has the ball in his hands in this team. And I also couple that with the Celtics clearly had a game plan to not give up corner threes mm -hmm. to try to just kind of clog the lanes. And I mean that with like passing and driving lanes. And Luka counteracted that by just finding quick opportunities and again the mismatches that he wanted and just the shots that he could get within that and made them a lot of pull-up mid-range jumpers and things and maybe that's you know gonna have to be you said it's not Kyrie's normal thing maybe it'll have to be but Luca had a 38 percent or 37 percent usage in this game yeah I'm not sure how much more you can get out of that and if the other guys are going to be sort of not put in a position to succeed the way they were against the Thunder or the Ma or, or the Wolves or the Clippers, I do think this is going to have to, it's going to have to run through Kyrie quite a bit. And it's going to be up to him to, to, I guess, size up what this actual opponent is giving him rather than just trying to, it, I think it just felt to me like he was trying to play the way they had against their previous opponents when that actually wasn't, really available to him anymore. So maybe these two days and some film will help, but I don't see a version where they win this series where it's Luca doing even more if the role players aren't going to do that. I like he's he's the second best player on this team for a reason. I think it's going to have to be him and he probably has to shoot it 19 times. Maybe let's just make a little more of him, I guess. That's kind of all you can ask for. Kyrie's got to be better. He has to be better. He's the guy that loosens things up for Luka Doncic. He's the one that makes you scared to overhelp on Luca, which Boston didn't, you know, very rarely did they do yeah. it. But when Kyrie gets going, it just forces a chain reaction to this offense. He, to your point, he has to be better. But this kind of brings me to my next overreaction. Cool. Sam Hauser, Luca stopper, elite defender, all NBA defense. How much can I go with this? Um, the Sam Somebody's going to overpay these Boston role players. I mean, I know Peyton Pritchard already got his next contract, but. Somebody's gonna give all these guys a bag. Like O'Shea Brissett next year, will probably be talking up to, or right. you know, who knows. But uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not willing to say outside the wait. confines of like the best roster in the NBA that it's gonna look so pretty. But hey, if they win the finals, I don't think anyone cares what their next contract is. Yeah, what team could just say like, okay, the Lakers just signed Sam Hauser. They're like, hey, look, we know that we gotta play. Uh, the the West goes through Dallas now, and we have the Luca stopper. <laughs> we got now. our Luca guy, yeah, fifteen million dollars a year. Um, I'm being facetious, obviously, but he did lock him up on a couple of occasions early in this he game. He, you know, he got isolated on the right side. Uh, like two possessions within uh, within like a three minute span. On one possession, he actually stripped the ball away from Luca. On the other one, he forced Luca into a tough step back jumper. Luca was over two on the on those shots, so. That it, it more so underscores the fact that at that point in the first quarter, Dallas was down, but they had they still had a window to get back into the game. And I think that those minutes where Sam Hauser or Peyton Pritchard are on the court are going to be defining pockets of this series potentially, where one of Luka Doncic or Kyrie Irving could pull those guys into the action and take advantage of them because those are and should be mismatches. And I didn't think Luka did a good job of that. I didn't think Kyrie Irving did a good job of that in this game. Yeah. And they didn't make them punish for those. They didn't punish the Celtics for those minutes. And in fact, Sam Hauser actually played really well in those moments. Luka's got to take advantage of that. He's got to press those because those are going to be the parts of the game where you're able to make up those deficits or expand, extend your lead or whatever it might be in that game. So um, 
they never really had to double Luca. They doubled Luca twice in this game. That's it. And so, and that's yeah. a that second spectrum. They were uh, sending like, like those late little kind Under of darting rim. over yeah. type of help. That's not a double, but yeah, yeah. I, I but don't you're really right. They didn't that. have yeah. to purely break their defense to go take something away from. In it. terms yeah, of the traps right. or doubling off the screens, they did it twice in the entire game. And one of them was in the fourth quarter. Uh, the game wasn't over yet, but it was almost over. Luka Doncic, the Kristaps Porzingis misses a jumper. The Mavericks smartly run off the rebound, quickly push the ball up the floor to prevent Boston from matching back up, and they end up with uh, Peyton Pritchard on Derek Lively. Lucas sees it, calls Lively up, and he's about to get switched under, get that Pritchard switch to bully him and get him under the basket. And Derek White says, "Nope, I'm not giving it to you. I'm not giving you the switch." It turns into a trap. Pritchard and White trapping Luca. Luca looks a little surprised. He almost like jumps. He's like, "What is this? You haven't been trapping me all game." And then it, it turns into a turnover, as opposed to a huge mismatch that boss that that uh, the Mavericks could have taken advantage of. They do it strategically. And what you said before, do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. That's the foundation that they laid, right? They're not going to double, but when they when they are forced to, right? When it makes sense strategically because they don't want Luke on Pritchard, then they're going to yeah. go ahead and double. And again, it turns into something that's a little bit more surprising and can almost throw Luca out of rhythm. So um, if they're going to be able to do that in this series, if Boston's going to be able to live with Hauser or Pritchard kind of one-on-one -on -one against Luca or Kyrie, I don't really see a way that the Mavericks... Are going to win this series that said i also don't expect this to be the case going forward in this series i think luca is too good too smart he's going to look at the film and he's going to say mm, i should have done this this and that i should have taken this angle i should have made this pass i thought luca left a lot of fruit on the on the tree i really do yeah. uh i know the usage rating was fine and he scored 30 points but that was one of the worst games i've seen from luca in these playoffs credit boston for forcing him into it but he's too good to do it again i think yeah, he looked, he looked scram. I mean, it kind of reminded me, frankly, of how we were talking about Jokic after those first couple Wolves games, right? Yeah, Where well it was said. like, he just was, why is he lost? Like, yeah. obviously, it's easy for us on our couches to be like, oh, they're doing this. But when it's so different and so unpredictable versus what you've seen every other step of the way, and I think, you know, the obvious thing that I think is going to be a talking point throughout this game, the, this Friday into Saturday into game two on Sunday is just the lack of the ability to use a center, right? And I think that that kind of takes me to, well, one to just point out uh, on the Pritchard side of it, he was terrible on offense and was a plus four in 16 minutes. So I feel like that, you know, that illustrates right. a lot of what you're saying. But um, to get to. Well, before you get to your next take. Yeah. Uh, I just have one more stat that I want to get in. I'm not sure we're going to okay. get it in. So because they didn't have to double Luca, they didn't have to play off those corners, right? They were PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. were basically covered in the yep. corners the entire game. The Mavericks survive on those corner threes. They're the best team in the league in generating those quarter threes. The Celtics are the best team at taking away those corner threes. And that was going to be a key battleground. We all knew it going into this series. Well the Celtics won that battle in game one. The the Mavericks were one for three on corner threes and the big number is the three attempts and by the way that yeah. one was josh green in garbage time i don't even count it while this game was mm. still the game they were over two oh, of two on corner threes. that's crazy uh the zero is a problem the two is a bigger problem you got to get up more <laughs> yeah. shots from the corners i i i don't think that that's going to be the case going forward i i think they're gonna they're, they're gonna meet in the middle a little bit more boston does do a good job of taking it away but i also there was a number of plays too where luca would get into the lane and then it was later in the game when Boston kind of already established their defensive identity. But Luca would just get into the lane and just try to force up shots instead of actually finding guys who were open in the corners. You mentioned already, Boston will send help when Luca gets that deep penetration. When that happens, we got to see more of those under the basket swing arm passes to mm -hmm. the corner to PJ Watson and DJJ. We didn't really see a whole lot of that in game one. I think we'll see more of it in game two. The other thing, just from like a mentality standpoint and how crazy these games can be and how, like you mentioned at the very top of the show, how quickly they can get out of hand is like, you could tell, I think Washington, I noticed it with the most, he just looked, his confidence was sapped like six minutes into the game, it kind of felt like. And mm -hmm. so just the reset might go a long way there. And where are you putting guys? I mean, my one of my overreactions was going to be the Celtics have the best defense in the NBA. I'm not really sure that's an overreaction, but yeah, it, it is just kind of... Rating. Yeah, it is, but it is kind of funny or interesting to just think like how 
It feels like every round of this postseason in the NBA so far, we've felt like we're naming a new best defense. It was like it was the Wolves in round two. Then it became the Mavs last round. Now I think the Celtics are kind of uh, in position to remind us that they've been the king there all season long. And it's a lot of these things we're talking about. And I think the 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 stat to me, aside from the corner threes, although it goes hand in hand, that illustrates it. The Mavs had nine assists in this game. Yeah. Three they just between Kyrie and Luka. They just channeled, Boston just channeled everything how they wanted it. And nobody was getting a shot that was, you know, a wide open breakdown type of play. And that's what assists obviously come off of. So, uh, but let's just close here. Maybe um, the Boston Celtics are unbeatable with Chris Stapps Porzingis. That's a good overreaction. That was my, there you go. That, you that was my last overreaction. <laughs> uh, they were 43 and 14 this season when Porzingis played. He had, I think, 11 points in the first quarter. Net rating was plus 30 in this game. Jalen Brown said post game that, you know, he was maybe an overlooked part of why they were at their most dominant when they were at their most dominant throughout the whole season. And they feel like they are a better team when he is on the court. And look, I do think, you know, we didn't see them use Kyrie as a screener much. We didn't see them consistently find ways to expose the Boston centers. I think both of those things in, in terms of their pick and roll attack on the Dallas side, they will do. Maybe we will feel feel differently about Porzingis if he is A, being switched out or having to really guard the pick and roll more, or yeah. if he's having to consistently be help at the back line when Dallas is getting this team into rotation more. So the defensive, I think, job he had to do he had some of those highlight blocks yes those were more in one-on-one -on -one situations deeper into the paint not as not something surprising to see Porzingis do if he's having to be more involved and more exposed maybe we do feel differently but on the offensive end man like what else could you ask for he he, he ended this game he came in and then the game was over because he got so hot right away yeah I mean those first Five minutes that he was on the court were just crazy. The Boston crowd was going nuts. The the Mavericks, uh, whatever lead they had early, just completely evaporated, and the game started getting pulled away. Yeah, you're, I thought the Porzingis minutes were the most impactful minutes in that first quarter in the entire game. I don't know if he's going to continue to come off the bench or not. Mm -hmm. will be interesting to see. He played just 20 minutes in this game, was super productive in those 20 minutes. Al Horford played almost 30 minutes of the, in the game. We'll see what it looks like over the weekend in game two. Are they more comfortable after seeing what Porzingis did in game one to give him the starting job back, play him closer to 30 minutes in this game? Do they even feel like they need to right now? Is another That's question. the question, right? So if, I, if I they do can think they should. throw the first I, punch in the first quarter and feel comfortable, then like why why risk injury, you know? But yeah, they probably there will be there will be a game where they have to, I think. You're right. If I'm a Celtics fan, I'm hoping that they just put Porzingis back in the starting lineup and don't mess around with this because you did what you had to do. Yeah, was it a blowout? Was it awesome? Did it feel great if you were at that arena and you're a Boston fan? Absolutely, but you still only won one game, and that was sort of the idea. You already have home, you were supposed to win that game. You have home court advantage. You have to win also game two. You can't risk anything. You know you're going to get a punch back from Luca and Kyrie and the Mavericks in game two. I wouldn't wait. I would if you it, health health permitting. Obviously, if the medical staff says. Chris Stapps is ready to play 30 minutes a game, and he's ready to start playing I mean, 30 minutes Missoula a game. Missoula said start. he doesn't have a minutes limit. So, yeah. He, he, so the 21 probably wasn't, you know, obviously yeah. the game was a blowout. Maybe he would have played more just if it was close. Good but I don't think they're holding him back necessarily. It just, you know, get the most out of him in limited minutes and win, then great, you know. But we'll see what happens in the future. I have a question on the Dallas side at the center spot before we move on to the Los Angeles Lakers, Wes, which is we saw Gafford played 14 minutes. Kleba played 19, Lively played 18. One, do you think we see a change in who's starting? And two, which of those guys did you like the most? Maybe those questions are in the wrong order. <laughs> uh, I kind of hated all their minutes. Lively was awful in this game. <laughs> uh, he had one shot attempt, two points, five rebounds, almost fouled out, picked up five fouls in the third quarter. Were a couple of them a little ticky-tack? Sure, but... Then wow, they were still, all in the third quarter. I did not realize that. That's you, brutal. You still picked up three one three fouls in the third quarter, even if it wasn't five. He was awful. Okay, okay. Uh, Daniel Gafford was a little bit better. I still think Lively should start. I think Lively is the better center for Me them. Too. I think he unlocks something for them offensively. I think he punishes Smalls a little bit more than Gafford does, 
even if he doesn't provide the same at the rim defense that Gafford provides, I'm not as worried about that in this matchup. If in game two, I think both teams should swap out their starting centers. I think Lively should be <laughs> yeah. back starting at the five for Dallas, and that's the Celtics should just let Porzingis off the leash and let him start in game two. Yeah, Kleba to me, there's like the te- maybe this idea, this hope that if you could play him at the four, potentially, he's a better shooter. Maybe you play him like over Derek Jones, but he was, I thought, exposed when he had to fly around and rotate. Yeah. Kleber when to he's me is closing good, out like, to a Drew minutes. Holiday, yeah. it's like, okay, now you're kind of, you look like, you know, you look like Maxi Kleba, and this team's a little too athletic and finesse for you, maybe. I agree. I think it might be too in the weeds with Lively, but I thought that in that third quarter, despite picking up more fouls than I realized, he he has this ability when he is at the dunker spot, or even in the roll, he's just a little more shifty, it feels like, and and less predictable. Whereas Gafford, it's like straight lines, grab the ball, go up, stand in your spot, if you know what I mean? And then with Lively, you know, Luca can be coming downhill, Tatum obviously had that center matchup most of the night. Lively will reposition himself kind of at the last minute to receive a pass or be in position for an offensive rebound. And I just think we know now that that's probably going to be the shape of a lot of offensive possessions for the Mavs. And I just want the guy who can do that better. Um, Frankly, I just think Lively is better than Gafford. Because we were saying the same thing in the Minnesota series that Lively was the better guy to be getting those short roll it passes and making a decision when Rudy was blitzing and now it feels the same when he's in the dunk. It's just like, okay, maybe just play the better guy, but all right. The Lakers after us all clowning them for weeks that they were going to hire a podcaster and broadcaster to be their next head coach with no experience. Wes (laughs) shocked us by coming out of nowhere to get, Maybe one of the best coaches in basketball, certainly one of the most accomplished over the past couple of years, and Dan Hurley from the UConn Huskies. And uh, a lot of interesting angles to this, I would say, just given the, the, the way it's being talked about by Woj and others, and the, I guess, role and responsibility they're looking to give Hurley, which is very different, I think, than how the Lakers have looked at the head coach spot for the past 10, 15 years. But also, of course, what that means for how they build out this roster and everything else. So what stands out to you? What's the next kind of domino you're watching for now that the Lakers have finished up the longest coaching search I can remember for a good team? There's kind of two angles that are really interesting to me on this. It's the process of how this all happened for the Lakers and whether or not Hurley is the right coach for the job. So we can kind of start on either I, I, maybe it's best to start with how the process played out before we get to what the sure. results are. I Basically, so, do you believe their BS? Is that is that your question? I am so confused. Yeah. I am flabbergasted by this entire situation. So basically, they interviewed Borrego and J.J. Redick, decided that they wanted to go with J.J. Redick, maybe also bring Borrego onto J.J. Redick's staff, hopefully, with some other big-name assistants. They were moving down the path with J.J. Redick, according to all this reporting, Everybody was clowning them about hiring a podcaster to be their head coach. And we get this Shams report from the athlete and, and an athletic report overall about how they view him as a Pat Riley type of guy. And he could, he's all these things and they're zeroing in on him. And it's just, it felt like it was just a matter of time. And then less than 24 hours later, Adrian Wojnarowski goes on ESPN and says, hold up, new coach entered the chat. We've got Dan Hurley. He's actually the favorite. Actually, they're already negotiating a uh, contract. Oh, my God. It's going to happen, guys. He's going to be the next Lakers head coach. And you're like, wait, we never even heard Hurley's name in regards to the Lakers head coaching opening. And they've they've gone from never us never hearing the name to the point where now they're zeroing in on him as a head coach. And not only that, that, the reporting, and Woj has repeated this multiple times since, that it was always him. So what was the Reddick part of this is interesting to me. Was was that just Reddick leaking it for leverage over ESPN? Was it the Lakers trying to throw z- nobody off the scent for no reason? I to, was it was it the Lakers trying to sabotage LeBron's podcast with JJ Reddick? Do they view that as a distraction and they want to get rid of it? I what is what was this? Well, 
as far as JJ Reddick goes, I think he probably we can assume was their clear number two. So I, I don't think that was fake, you know. Now, was Hurley always their number one? Did he become their number one? I think that's where it kind of gets interesting. And there's a few little like breadcrumbs, I guess, that jumped out to me. One is this idea that was out there in some of the reporting that Anthony Davis preferred Borrego. Mm -hmm. And there was this whole, like, I think Haslam and Perkins both said it on, on TV and, um, I don't know, maybe it even leaked from somebody around the Lakers that AD's desires and future and fit should be prioritized right. more over LeBron's. And I think to anybody but the Lakers or maybe the team trying to keep LeBron happy, that's obvious. But of course, it's LeBron and he's his own animal to, to deal with every offseason. So I get it. Maybe that led to somewhat of a pivot. I don't know. The other part would be this little chuckle fest that JJ and LeBron had on an episode of the podcast. Not this one that came out this week, but two weeks before that, where they kind of giggled to themselves about like a distraction or some kind of noise. or And it was very obvious they were talking about the rumors that, that Reddick would become the head coach of the team. So that obviously kind of legitimizes that, of course, it, it's not, it wasn't fake, but that they both were taking it seriously enough that they would right. like publicize it and not, you know. And so I guess I come down to two things. One is, did well, can I add one more nugget? Yeah, JJ Redick went on some sort of podcast. It was uh, I forget. It was it the the Golic uh, yeah. guys? And he said, uh, in regards to the Shams reporting, I'll deal with Shams after the finals. So he clearly was yeah. unhappy with how Shams went about reporting the Reddick stuff. I don't know why he was unhappy, whether it was true, false, or something in between, but that to me was a little interesting as well. Yeah, he, he wasn't pleased there. And so I guess my question is, one, on the Woj side of it, it's your job to tell us what's always been true. So it's a little bit obnoxious to come out and say it's always been this. Well, then, like, you're paid a lot of money to tell us those things. Just when they out themselves on this like insider trading stuff, it drives me crazy. Whatever, right. not a big deal. Um, was Bo was I? I'm gonna probably say Bobby Hurley a lot of times because he coaches my alma mater and their brothers. But Danny Hurley, Dan Hurley, is he? Uh, was he maybe not interested until recently? Was he wooed by this massive contract they're supposedly giving him, which is, again, not normal for the Lakers? I think that's maybe where I could be convinced that maybe there was some crush they had on him from the beginning, but they didn't think it was realistic. He might have said no, and so they just kind of moved on. But I also can buy, we all thought they were waiting because Redick was calling the finals and they wanted to be respectful of ESPN. I'm kind of like, well, Charles Lee's sitting on the Boston bench right now with the head coaching job already like this is not exactly out of the ordinary for guys to get jobs while they're supposed to be doing other jobs in the nba so maybe they were just waiting because they were holding out hope that dan hurley became available it, it doesn't mm. make no sense but it it's a little it, i mean it's obviously very out of nowhere and it's, it's convoluted I think he, and i think that when you look at leaks you have to remember that most leaks, most sources said type things are 90% leverage. That's what most yeah. of that exists for. 10% of it is true. 90% of it is for leverage. Uh, Dan Hurley was also eligible for a contract extension from UConn. And after back-to-back -back national championships, he probably wanted that right now. And he might have not been getting it or might have not there gotten go. the power at UConn that he wanted. So was he keeping things on the DL for very obvious reasons because he didn't want to put the the – the university in a bad spot if indeed he did get the extension and was able to come back. So it makes sense for Hurley to keep those leaks to a zero the entire time. Mm -hmm. But were the Lakers perhaps pushing the Reddick thing in order to leverage Hurley to make a decision sooner rather than later because they're going like down the that. road of the Reddick thing? That's sort of where I land on this. But um, it is sort of the whole process of it is a little interesting also because everybody was clowning the Lakers for the Reddick hire. And then kind of all around the board universally praised the Hurley hire 
yeah. as an or an idea as a head coach. So I do think some of this too is the Lakers just throwing this out there through the media and saying, "Do you guys think this is a good idea? Do you guys think this is a good idea?" Which, for the record, is not a good way to hire a head coach, but is the you way think? the Lakers go about hiring head coaches. They also, I guess, tend to look at LeBron James's social media to put together their candidate pool. Oh, you're on a podcast with J.J. Redick? He seems smart at basketball. Let's make him our favorite as a head coaching candidate. You once tweeted about Hurley a couple of years ago that he runs a good offense. I mean, did you not learn from the Miami Heat drafting Shabazz Napier? You don't go by LeBron's social media to run your organization. Hurley might be an awesome coach, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But what troubles mm -hmm. me about the Lake, if I'm a Lakers fan, is the process by which they went about this. It just, it doesn't make you feel good about the way they're running that organization. Okay, so let's talk about uh, his fit. And I think the process is actually connected here because um, if you remember 2019 or sorry, 2018, when they hired Frank Vogel, they there was this whole thing about their reticence to give long-term contracts and the lakers have kind of become known for cheaping out on head coach contracts they've obviously there's this idea that they go after stars and yes they got phil jackson 20 years ago and then 25 and then brought him back 10 years after that but other than that it, they haven't really now they are you know and all this language around building a program and you know uh, creating this this brand of basketball and this what it means to be a laker type of thing of course that's what you would say if you're hiring a college coach that's kind of the point but it's very different than what what they've looked at before and it's also a little bit unique to hear for a team that is very much in win now mode so that interests me and then so does the offensive philosophy we're hitting on that obviously lebron is praised both in in on twitter but also you know in that podcast that he does with Redick. It's very egalitarian. It's very complex. It doesn't feel like something LeBron would naturally fit into. So I think there will be some give and take. That said, to bring it back to Anthony Davis, the building a program idea, the egalitarian offense idea, those both make perfect sense for Anthony Davis. So I'm not going down so far as to say, what does this mean for if LeBron will stay or go? Because I think he's probably already decided that regardless of what happens with the head coaching mm -hmm. search. But I will just say, I like the idea of it, and I think Anthony Davis is a really great player that shouldn't get lost in all this. So that was kind of my main takeaway is just, if they're going to give him control here and they're going to allow him to install an offense and, and build this thing a different way than they have, especially as LeBron eventually retires, whether he signs here again or not, I think the Anthony Davis side of it could really benefit. Sure, and uh, whatever other young players that they have or whatever players they trade for this offseason, I don't have a problem with the idea. Look, I think more teams should approach it saying we want a long-term head coach to establish a culture. We don't want to be plugging in, in a new head coach every few years. That's just not a way to do things. You look at the most successful organizations in NBA history. They have cultures. They have a way of doing business, and they have head coaches in place for a very long time. Although LeBron James has not needed that to be one of the most successful players in NBA history, uh, it is a good thing for the Lakers to think about the post-LeBron future because he's probably only got another couple of years left in the NBA. So I I get all of it. Um, it is a little high risk. I think Hurley's an awesome coach. He's shown throughout college to be very adaptable, right? He used to run a very pick-and-roll heavy offense. He changed it in his most recent stop to be more of a you know uh, egalitarian, like you said, move the ball, spacing, all that kind of stuff. I think he'll adapt to the personnel. I don't think he's sort of uh, in, I don't think he has a dogma in terms of, I want to play this way and I only want to play this way. He's been wildly successful at the college level. He has zero NBA head coaching experience. And uh, I don't and he's know. He's only 51 or something, right? So I think he's 51. So that's not this. And it's not Tom Izzo coming to coach the Cavs once upon a time right. when LeBron was asking for that. It's, you know, he's a fairly young guy and a fairly young coach, even though and he's modern thinking he's forward thinking, like I said, adaptable. And these are all things that you want to look for if you're going to pull somebody up from the college ranks to the NBA ranks. But the numbers that are being reported or kind of hinted at right now in terms of like what Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, Eric Spolstra got long term, lots of money. That's very risky for a guy who's never... You'd like to at least get a little bit of proof of concept at the NBA level before you start handing out a contract rivaling 
the some of the greatest coaches we've ever seen in the league, right? Because there's a big difference between being a successful coach and one of the greatest ever, which is what these contracts are getting. That said, that's yeah. probably the only way you're able to pull them away from UConn. So I get I think it. that's just the price of hiring a coach right now. You know, it's it. If you're hiring a coach with pedigree, it's probably hard to say we're not going to pay you that much. Like Lou just got an extension. Spo got his extension. Mike Budenholzer came to Phoenix. He's making eight figures. I mean, I know Dan Hurley's not on the level, but I mean, is he that far off from Mike Budenholzer? I know Bud won a championship, we don't know. but we if you're no great idea. and you have the leverage like he does, I, I, I don't know if they were going to get to go lower than that, you know? Probably not. Like, if they could have gone lower, they probably would have, right? And so that's the yeah. whole idea here. So I, and I get all this. I think it's a, I think it'll be a fine hire. I think their head, I think their heart is in the right place in terms of wanting to build a program. <laughs> this is the Lakers who over the last 20 years have had 10 different head coaches. They're, they cycle through a new head coach on average every two years. That's not good. You want to find yeah. something. Maybe you pay him so much money that you're forced to keep him there. That could be a good, that could be a good uh, thing for the Lakers, sort of being forced to stick with something and yeah. not be so impulsive when it comes to their head coaches. So we'll see. We'll see if it's – nobody knows if he's, going to be a, if he's going to do a good job. If, they, if he indeed is the head coach for the Lakers, I think there's a lot of reasons for Lakers fans to be excited about it, and maybe they could finally get out of their own way because they box themselves into a corner with this contract, but we'll see what happens. All right, off-season-wise, yep. LeBron James option and next contract is, of course, the far and away the biggest thing in their uh, pathway here. The contract could be, there's a few different versions of it, but he's going to get a raise. I think he, we would imagine he will, he will opt out. The question just becomes, okay, so three years, 162 million, is if he opts out kind of the the biggest most extensive contract he could sign he could do two years 104 million he could i guess not opt out and sign an extension although that's just kind of taking money away do you have major thoughts or guesses about any of this it kind of just feels like he knows what the options are the max he can sign elsewhere is already set in stone if he went to philly or something I don't I have a lot takes, of intrigue outside of what does he eventually choose to do. I think he takes three years at the most money, and it wouldn't shock me if he negotiated a no-trade clause into there after the Warriors rumors happened around the trade deadline. Like, nope, it's not gonna. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> yeah. Not only are you gonna have to call me to ask, you're gonna actually. I'm gonna have to sign off on it via contract. Yeah. So maybe he's the only player other than Bradley Beal in the league with a no-trade clause. <laughs> there you go, uh, D'Angelo Russell player option. This one's Feels more interesting like, one to me. Really. Yeah, because if he so it's eighteen million dollars for next year, he mm -hmm. can opt out, test free agency, maybe get the mid level exception for multiple years, and that would be interesting. But the Lakers have worked with D'Lo in the past on these kinds of contracts, and I do wonder if they would be able to convince D'Angelo Russell to opt in and then trade him to the place where he wants to go, which might not be able to sign him outright if he were to just opt out, right? Because if he just gets traded, some of the options get unlocked. And so um, if he opts in, obviously it helps the Lakers because it gives them one other chunky salary to move in a big trade. Not that yeah. they necessarily need it to pull off a big trade, but it's helpful. Uh, but I do wonder if they just say, look, opt in. You're going to make more money than you would make on the open market for this next year. Then you get to become a free agent next summer. If you opt in, we'll get you to a spot where you want to be because we already plan to go trade for DeJounte Murray or Trey Young or something like that and probably sure. replace you. And D'Lo's been willing to play ball. He's been very open about that, whether it was with the Warriors or the, the Lakers. He's like, just give me the most money possible, and I'll play ball with you. And if you move me in February, that's fine with me. So um, that, to me, is, is more interesting. I wouldn't rule out D'Angelo Russell opting in and then with the understanding that he's going to get traded to Brooklyn or something for Dorian Finney-Smith yeah. or some, something like that. So I like the idea and, and it is interesting. I don't think he's going to get $19 million more than that on the open market this year, but there's all, always that, well, if you get more total guaranteed money over multiple years, maybe that's just worth it to lock in the long-term security and, and everything else. And I think he would get that. Yep. Um, but I also think he's only 28. So there's a, okay, well, I can make 19 million this year and then do that next year. You know, I don't think it's as if he's, his career is... Uh, about to fall apart by any means he's still a productive serviceable player just maybe Endurable. not on a team trying to win a championship and durable and yeah and yeah so maybe maybe a little bit more of a i don't even necessarily want to say floor raiser but 
uh, he's not going to kill you. And a, and a, a younger, more building team might might like the idea of him just kind of running the show. I, all, you know, like you said, do they need him to make a trade? Not necessarily, but you're just talking about having to give up more players total if you're going to add up to a big contract if if Russell's not not around. That actually brings me to the first question I have um, about their offseason, which is, do you agree, dating back to the deadline, but even now you're hearing it again in the rumor mill that Austin Reeves is being treated as close to untouchable in some of these trade conversations. Do you buy that? Do you no. think he Selling should it. be? Uh, okay. I get why he's so valuable to this team. He's on an awesome contract. He has great chemistry with the two stars. He's a very valuable player. They shouldn't just come off of him for anything. He's not untouchable. Get out of here. If they're getting a superstar player, he's super touchable. Um, well, then what's the level of player that would qualify for, as the superstar you just said that would make you get rid of him? I, agreed. I kind of think they were right to not give him up for Murray. Yep, I'm personally above, but like that Donovan Zach Mitchell Levine, or something Murray level above that. Donovan Mitchell, Trey Young, go ahead and give him up sure. below. But if that it's the Zach Levine, Dejounte Murray kind of range, no, not worth it, especially considering his salary. Yeah, Reeves had an interesting season last year where his free throw rate went down, but his playmaking numbers went up. I also, so, you know, I think we're just kind of finding out what he is. He's 25. He's probably in the new NBA officiating world, maybe not going to just be this guy that can get to the line 10 times in a game, but maybe he is a little bit more serviceable as a primary ball handler than we might've thought. So that's fine. He's good. But, you know, also the guy that in his first go round in 2023 in the postseason was guarding John Morant in the playoffs think we've i think we've had to come down from the yeah. idea that he's going to be a stopper and he wasn't able to you know guard, guard jamal murray consistently in either of the past two playoffs or anything like that so you know probably an above average starter what he does on offense is valuable but not some kind of can't miss guy now his contract's awesome so i think that plays a role you know just giving that up and and the cheap difference maker that that he represents for again a a non-star is yeah i think they're right to do that but yeah if, if they get into their mix for a real superstar i think he'll be gone um they are 10 million away from the second apron and they're already in the first apron with 12 guys under contract torian prince is a free agent etc and uh, max christie's a restricted free agent so if they give lebron a little bit of a raise and maybe they trade for uh, a, a higher paid player like you know, Mitchell or something, and they only give up, you know, a little bit shy of his salary. They add money there. They sign a free agent for maybe, you know, however much. Like, the second apron is not right a distant concern for them. So that's just something to consider here. Um, what are their team needs, I think, is, is a good yeah. question, considering where they got to go forward. So we mentioned the player options. They have up to three first-round picks that they're able to trade starting on draft night. Um, to me, I look at the Lakers. They need a dynamic perimeter scorer, a guy who could take the load off of LeBron and Anthony Davis a little bit more, who's probably, if you had, you know, your druthers, you'd probably a little bit better than D'Angelo Russell, a little bit better than Austin Reeves. That's why they've been mentioned for Trey Young and Donovan Mitchell and these guys. And I still think they need another wing defender. And that would be the two biggest needs for me. Would you agree on that? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, they need They need another... LeBron is not an offensive engine consistently good enough and I guess like varied enough in his attack anymore to be able to compete with a Nikola Jokic, a Luka Doncic in, in the latter rounds of the playoffs. So that's number one. Wing defender, I think they can find, like having Anthony Davis goes a long way there, Yeah, but it is a need. And Jared Vanderbilt was hurt, but I don't know if he's playable at the end of the day, given his... Right complete you know really nothing on offense so so i have my list top five lakers offseason targets are you ready yes let's do it number five dorian finney smith from the brooklyn nets i think if you could trade d'angelo russell there you get a wing defender back a little bit more versatility contingent on the fact that you would probably be getting an upgrade at that point guard spot would help this team a lot number four michael porter jr could you bunch a couple of things together, send it to Denver with some draft capital, help Denver by adding some depth on their end, 
and then you get a big wing who could space the floor around LeBron and Anthony Davis. Kind of like that as a fit. Michael Porter Jr., I mean, it's like Channing Fry or, you know, Chris Bosh, Kevin Love. It, it Like, he would have been prime LeBron. Porter Jr. would have averaged 21 points per game on seven made threes and, right. and just cooked for life. Yeah. Number three, Darius Garland. Just because he's the worst point guard of the ones I'm about to tell you. Uh, I like the fit okay. there. We could talk about the clutch stuff. Uh, it's not all that interesting to me, but it is a relationship. And sure. uh, if this next guy doesn't get traded, he could be the guy. But their primary Clav- Cavaliers target should be Donovan Mitchell for obvious reasons. Yeah. He's just a better player, dynamic scorer, can shoulder the scoring load. Uh, and let LeBron and ready to win now, right? Diamond. Like that's the thing yeah. with you got to be finding a player who, you know, honestly, I don't know where you're going next, but some of the other players out there, it's like, ha- have they proven they can fit in a team context or that they can, you know, win at the highest level or have they gone through taking their lumps in the postseason because they're younger? Mitchell, I have none of those concerns about. He is plug in, and I could see them competing for a championship with him immediately. So I'm surprised he's number two. Well, if you're looking for a guy who fits into a team concept, don't look at number one on this list because it's Trey Young. Uh, I I think he's actually the better fit for the Mm. Lakers more than Donovan Mitchell. Am I saying that because I'd prefer Donovan Mitchell to end up in Miami? Who's to say? But I do think that Trey Young, I like the idea of him just running pick and roll with Anthony Davis and LeBron, who's turned into a good three-point shooter. You can't leave him alone. Kind of spacing the floor and being that second-side attacker to just help him survive the, the 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 dog days of the regular season a little bit more. I kind of like that as a team concept for them. And I do think that if the Lakers were able to also get that other wing defender. So if you can go get a Dorian Finney-Smith and a Trey Young this summer, then I think you have enough defense between DFS, Anthony Davis, some of the other guys on this roster, LeBron when he's engaged. Uh, there's enough defense on this roster to cover up from Trey Young. And if you can convince Trey Young then also to be a little bit more, to just give a little bit more effort defensively than he's given the last couple of years in Atlanta. And we saw a little signs of that last year in Atlanta. So if you get him in that system, I, I think it would just be really interesting maybe is where I where I fell on number one. He would I don't be more disagree. I mean, me. I, I think Trey as an AD partner makes a yeah. ton of sense. And he's a top I, 10 offense. He is. Yeah. The guy is, is so dynamic. Is. And that's where the Lakers have struggled the last couple of years. Agreed. You know, the idea of like when LeBron leaves the court, what happens? Mm-hmm. I worry a lot less about. I also think Trey and LeBron as a pick and roll tandem has some yep. intrigue on with both guys handling it. You mentioned LeBron is a good three point shooter and second side attacker. He's also an amazing cutter. He can kind of catch the ball in the short roll. I mean, he's this. He played center three years ago for that one season. Like he he pretty much has proven. You put him anywhere, is he comfortable? Is a question, but he can do all the different things. And I think it would benefit them to have to put less on him. So Trey is probably the guy that can shoulder more of that load and and everything else. Whereas Donovan, I guess it's maybe unfair to to say that about him, but he be, I guess he doesn't lift all ships quite as much as maybe Trey does. That's kind of the, the difference there. Donovan is sort of like, that's your, that's sort of your team. That's sort of your offense. Now Trey is, Maybe like I don't I don't understand fully this idea of Trey being selfish. I know there's always the rumors about guys not liking to play with him, but we don't say that about Luca and they play pretty similarly, you know? It, it's right. Trey Young it's just odd. takes more weird shots that make you cringe early in the clock. And I think from an aesthetic point that's it's cringeworthy, right? It's just a little but if he's not gonna do that somewhere, it's gonna be playing with LeBron and I think that it would also be beneficial for him to play in that context. So yep. That's my top five. Um, All right, I like it. I, before we sign off here, I have a question mm-hmm. for you, a personal question. Okay. So this local mm-hmm. news outlet recently did a ranking of the top something, top 20 Cuban sandwiches in Miami. Um, okay. And it got me thinking. The results came out this morning, and I was like, is the Cuban sandwich my favorite sandwich? And I don't think it is, but a great Cuban sandwich is awesome. So if you are going to take the Nikola Jokic – Luka Doncic level sandwich, right? Like, so it's just, it's a great, it's a perfectly made sandwich. It's the best of the best of this particular yeah. sandwich. What is the best sandwich? 
For a second, I thought you were going to have me do some kind of comp sandwich-wise to how <laughs> those two players play basketball, and I was like, Wes, I need more advanced notice That's too galaxy brain for than me. this. Uh, okay. Um, so basically, like, the to me, probably, and this is, this is closer to burger, maybe. I don't know. You'll have to be the, the decider, but any sort of like southern chicken sandwich so that could be hot chicken which is kind of you know getting popular now or like the popeyes chicken sandwich chick-fil-a if you're more uh you know used to that but like a a fried somewhat spicy chicken sandwich you know put some a little bit of mayo on it put a little bit of pickle maybe probably don't need to get too much more complicated than that that's where i would go that that's when i'm just like i want a a great lunch that's gonna hit the spot. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty set up if I'm getting something like that. That's my pick. It's a great answer. The great thing about the spicy chicken sandwich, the southern you can you can eat it indoors, you can eat it outdoors. It's fine for lunch. It's fine for dinner. Heck, throw the buns off, put a waffle underneath it. That's your that's breakfast, baby. You can kind of go any direction with it. So it's a great a little answer. spicy. That's one of the, you know you it's maybe too. not always. I might not always be in the mood for it. That that might be the one downside, but you know, if you're comparing it to like a peanut butter and jelly or something, it's you know, come on. It's not close. The reason I wanted to point out like the best version of the best sandwich too is because if if it was sort of the highest floor sandwich, just give me a club sandwich. That's it's a high floor, but the ceiling isn't very high, right? You just you know what you're gonna get. It's gonna be solid everywhere you order it. You don't really have to worry about it. But if I'm going and this isn't even my favorite sandwich, but if I'm going at the very tip top best version of this, it might be a meatball sub for me. Cause really? the floor too is messy. pretty low. And you have to open you gotta the biting it is too hard. That's my if it's issue. Made with the well, meatball sub. If it's made well, I I like when they slice the meatball. So you kind of have yeah. these sliced yeah, yeah, layers yeah. of meatball with the melted cheese. The sauce is not over over the top crazy. You know, you're getting it pretty fresh. I don't want it toasted. Miss me with toasted subs. I'm not a know. toasted f- sub fan. I think it's a sin against whatever higher being you believe in. But I, if you get that fresh roll that's not like mm. already crumbling from the sauce or something like that, and there's a good distribution of the sauce across the, the sandwich, the meatball sub might have the highest ceiling of all of it, but I rarely order a meatball sub because I'm so afraid. It's very high risk, high reward. It's, it, it's a dangerous yeah. game you play when you order a meatball sub and if you're not familiar with that place. I gotta say, there's a place down the street. I I happen to live by like the best like Italian cold cut, one of the best in all of like the wider Phoenix area. Not why I moved here, but not not why I moved here, you know. <laughs> um, and you like you like the best higher quality from an actual deli or like you know Italian yeah. kind of market, like Subway, but times three million right. type of sandwich. That's that was, that's pretty. That might be my number. You, it you could can't, be. It was the other one that I was considering. So there's this place. Uh, they've got a couple of storefronts here called Laspadas here in South Florida, and it's classic New York style deli where they slice everything on order. They start. They they literally throw the meat across the 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 hall to the guy who's making and constructing your sandwich. The bread is baked in house every day. It's perfect. They don't toast it. I don't even think if you ask for a toasted that they would toast it for you. Again, that's the right way to eat a cold cut sub. Um, and everything on it is perfect. It's a perfect sandwich. They do their special, I think, is the is roast beef, turkey, and ham. Whatever cheese you want, load it with whatever toppings you want. It is a perfect sandwich. I used to go there probably once a weekend when I was taking summer school classes at, at a local community college uh, to try to pass my math classes. But um, it was right around the corner, and I loved it. So sandwiches i don't ever think about it that the, your question is making me like zoom out of my brain to actually contemplate because it's just so it's just a staple so but this became a actually hot, this, rank this became it a anything. very important topic for me when i moved to san francisco actually because mm-hmm. i couldn't find a great sandwich because i never had to think about it on the, live, growing up on the east coast there was just great sandwiches all the time and on in in san francisco there's incredible food like some Michelin star restaurants, all these things. But for on a Tuesday for lunch, I'm not trying to go to a Michelin star restaurant and be served something 
with a micro foam on it or yeah, something. Exactly, I just exactly, I need exactly. I need a sandwich, and I had a really. They hard probably time. would have have a different word for sandwich at some of those restaurants, like <laughs> right. It's a a stack a, or a something, reconstructed you know? um, something. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was just a difficult thing for me to find was a very solid sandwich in San Francisco. And I know that people could come, people used to come at me all the time. I used to complain about this all the time on, the, on my podcast everywhere when I used to do the Warriors show. They're like, no, you got to try this place. You got to try. And I would take them up on my rec- their recommendations. And I'm, I would just continually be like, this is not a good sandwich. I need a good sandwich. And to me, the bread has to be great. The cold cut sliced very thin. I don't want Thanksgiving slices yes. on my ham or my turkey. No, no, no. I need very thin. thin and I need and and all the toppings with the with the oil and vinegar and the salt and pepper and all that kind of stuff. That isn't a that is a right sandwich, and I had a hard time finding it in San Francisco. So this is a this is a uh, a topic near and dear to my heart. I probably should have stood up for talked up my region a little bit more. A torta, very good sandwich as well, is. like a, a Mexican. It's pretty much just like a burrito on bread. Yeah. But what's the what's the problem with that? You know, you might as well put that type of food on every kind of carb you can and just what which one am i in the mood for how big do i want it to be how thick do i want it to be but all right more time on sandwiches than lebron james's free agency that was the just basketball show hit follow hit subscribe we'll be back monday after game two of the nba finals the wnba season rolls on the off season not too far ahead free agency starting technically the day after the finals is a wrinkle that i don't think we're we're prepared for so we'll be on top of all of it follow us on social media In the meantime, enjoy the hoops. We'll talk to you next week.